Time and Black Shores uh, Merton. On the 50th anniversary of BSM, it is fitting to discuss time. Time is everything in finance, in financial models, in BSM itself, and in the financial market. Or rather, should I say, the future uh, is everything. BSM is a formalism. As we interpret it differently, we interpret its time or its future uh, differently. So how has BSM survived through time? How is the future looking uh, for BSM today? Some people think, opinion differ. Some people think that BSM has still got time ahead of it. Uh, typically, this is Lorenzo Bergomi in his Stochastic Volatility Modeling book. He says, it may come as a surprise to many that despite the widely publicized inconsistency between the actual dynamics of financial securities and the idealized log normal dynamics of the BSM model, it is still used daily in banks to risk manage derivatives books. Other people think that BSM has no future. Uh, typically, uh, Jean-Philippe Bouchot, in a recent article in Wilmot, writes the following, post Black Scholes research should have abandoned the perfect replication fallacy. Option theory should be taught starting from generic models, which place the emphasis on risk and the impossibility of perfect hedges, relegating Black Scholes as a very special case. And finally, you have people who think that BSM is just an accident of the past. Uh, typically, Hans Bühler, in a podcast for Risk magazine, In Relation with Deep Hedging, declares, the Greeks framework was developed at a time where data and computing were very restricted. It was the right, it was the right choice to do then. But if you were today, knew nothing about the problem and would just start working on it, I don't think you would come up with BS BSM. Opinion can also become very extreme, uh, for you have people, for instance, who argue that we have never used the Black Scholes Merton pricing uh, formula, typically Hogue and Talib in a 2007 paper, and other people will argue the contrary by saying that we have always used the Black Scholes Merton option pricing formula, Corrado 2009. So let's get back to the different ways that BSM is understood or interpreted, because of course, the BSM model that uh, Bergomi is considering is different from the one that Bouchot is considering. Uh, so typically, Bouchot was um, raising criticism against this uh, interpretation of Black Scholes, which is the um, textbook interpretation or the very um, um, uh, conventional one. Uh, whereby BSM is a model of the underlying asset price, therefore a model of the underlying truth. As such, it's, it is supposed to be connected to real statistics. And if you believe in it, you should use it as a prediction tool in an ex-ante attitude and use it not only to hedge perfectly derivatives, but use it also to risk, to risk manage derivatives portfolio independently of the derivatives market. The other view, the one by Bergomi, uh, holds on the contrary that BSM is a superficial pricing formula. Uh, you should only use it on the surface of the market. You use it as a market maker to generate non-arbitrage derivative prices. And if, if anything, you compute the PNL of hedged portfolio ex post in the hope that you have a break-even volatility ex post. Ex post meaning without any assumption or any a priori theory about the underlying truth or the underlying uh, stochastic process. The later models, uh, the more advanced ones that followed uh, Black and Scholes, abide by the same division. You have, on the one hand, models of the assets volatility, and the last instance of which is the rough volatility model, which became known as God's model, because they think they are finally delivering the final truth about the underlying uh, process. And uh, Bouchot likes, for instance, the rough volatility model, as opposed to the market models, where there is no such a belief in a hidden uh, truth or underlying truth or metaphysical belief uh, of the like, but there is only a pricing function that we use on the surface and break even covariance matrices that we hope to get. I myself uh, think that BSM is not only a formula, it's a magic formula, even a sublime formula, as I show, hope I will show later. So because the future is everything, my, my talk will uh, be divided this way. In the first part, I will expand on the technology of the future, and by that I mean the technology of derivative pricing that is post Black Scholes. And in the second part, I will just try to get something stronger than a technology, which is literally the language of the future. And I will do that using a twist, using a trick, which will actually allow me to uh, operate a return uh, to BSM. 
And finally, if I have time, because I'm in the business of discussing languages and language models, perhaps I will have time to say a few words about DSM and ChatGPT or GPT. So technology of the future. So here the hope is that this technology will help us uh, finally uh, solve the, uh, the shortcoming uh, that all uh, the uh, models like Black Shoals or other financial models uh, suffer from, which is that they are backward looking uh, rather than forward looking. A shortcoming that is, for instance, formulated by Jeremy Bernstein, a physicist in his book, Physicist on Wall Street, where he writes, so why would I, as a physicist, find the Black Shoals model quite odd? The object of physical models, he says, is to predict the future, but the Black Shoals model is quite different. It uses a model of the future, so therefore it freezes the future in order to describe the present. So here you can see the, the backward uh, motion here. So what is the development in the technology that can help us overcome this? It is what we can call grown-up finance. It is represented by the market models, and according to that, it would be a mistake to even think of the underlying model because the model, as we said, is backward. For instance, Bergomi argues that the mistake done in master's degrees in quant finance is to start from the assumption of a stochastic process for the underlying, a thing we're not even sure exists. On the contrary, we should think that God doesn't exist, underlying truth doesn't exist, the underlying process doesn't exist, therefore we cut any relation to the backward model which is supposed to underlie this. We should only keep the surface uh, BSM pricing function or pricing formula, not the model, the underlying model of the underlying price. And the BSM pricing function typically will be written as a function P of time T and the stock price S with hopefully a break even volatility level sigma. And the later market models will just uh, be more general than that and add a further uh, hedging instruments which typically will be uh, vanilla options, or in the case of Bergomi, uh, forward uh, variance contracts, a continuum of such, such, such instruments, mind you, which are indexed uh, by their maturity capital T, uh, with the hope of getting break-even covariance matrices. But the tacit assumption in this new technology, which will allow us eventually to turn backward from to, to forward, the tacit assumption of the market models is the continued existence of the volatility market. So for instance, Bergomi, even at the stage where he is deriving the Black-Scholes formula, so this is the stage where there is no option market yet because only the underlying S is trading. He says the following, he says, in the absence of a volatility market for the, for the stock S, sigma, our estimate of volatility, should be chosen as the best estimate of future realized volatility. So he doesn't like that. He would rather prefer that there is a volatility market. So even though the derivative market doesn't exist, at least it exists in Bergomi's mind because he wants ideally such a market to exist in order to infer volatility uh, from it, failing which he can only uh, settle for an estimate of future uh, realized volatility, therefore statistics. But at a later stage, when vanilla options will start becoming trading and will become the new underliers, and as we know, all know, options then will be hedged with options. Uh, typically, exotics will be hedged with, with vanilla. Uh, one could argue that the backward logic that we are complaining from, the backward logic of underlying and derivatives is abolished. Why? Because if derivatives, if uh, vanilla options themselves become the new underliers, therefore, Philosophically speaking, they can no longer be underlain by the underlying. They are themselves on an equal footing on the same floor as the underlying. There is no logic of derivatives underlying them. So if we now form the pricing function P, which has the price of the stock S and the price of the implied volatilities of this vanilla as variable, a pricing function which allows us to price an exotic uh, uh, derivative, in the same way, we will not say that the exotic is derivatives on the vanilla. On the contrary, I would argue that this pricing function is the automatic pricing function of the market. Why automatic? Because we have abolished the whole logic, the whole backward logic of underlying and derivative. And it's as if this function was responding to me every time the automatic response of the market. I ask it, what is the price of the exotic? And given the market conditions, which are represented by the prices of the vanillas, it tells me this is the price of the exotic automatically. There is no backward movement anymore. And by the way, if you read through Bergomi, there is nothing to compel the additional, um, the additional um, the instruments here, the size that I'm using as underlying. There is nothing to compel them to be themselves derivative on the stock S. They could be, be, they could be anything. If that is the pricing function of the market and it wants to have other instruments altogether than the ones that we should expect, how can we argue with the market? 
Nevertheless, even at that stage, Bergomi will still want to get to the next volatility market, which in this case will be um, uh, the, the market on, of options of next generation, typically uh, options on VIX or, uh, or options on variance. He says, if there existed a market of options written on the vanilla options, the size, the volatility of those size would be derived from that market implied volatilities. So you see that he's always wishing that this pricing function infers whatever statistical parameter it has, not from statistics, but from the next generation uh, derivative market. So which means that recalibration is actually the tacit rule here. Why recalibration? Because at any stage uh, that I'm standing, I always want my parameters to be gotten from the next market. Even if such a market doesn't exist, I wish it existed. So I wish my pricing function to be constantly recalibrated to prices of things that don't, don't exist yet. And in this sense, I think that the pricing function of the market models is quite extraordinary. I prefer to call it a pricing writing function because even though it is underlain by a stochastic model or, or stochastic or correlation structure in all practical instances, for instance, Bergomi will propose the two factor Bergomi model, no such stochastic model is ever final because in essence, as I said, the pricing function will keep looking for the next generation derivative market. The stochastic model that underlies it only uh, in practical implementation is backward, as we said, whereas the pricing function is superior to it. It's always looking forward. I prefer to say that it writes the market. It writes the futures as it goes. And uh, as a matter of fact, it will be itself be writing the prices of the future of the next generation derivatives that it will use at the next stage. So if we push the reasoning to the limit, the pricing function is ultimately a function with no parameters, but only underlying variables that overtake any parameters, because any parameters that you have temporarily, will, we, we, we would want ideally to infer them from the prices of options of next generation. Therefore, these are prices and there will become variables of your pricing function. So as such, because it has no parameters, but only variables, the pricing function cannot be written only the underlying model that you project it on temporarily uh, can be written. So because there is no explicit model underlying it, you can think of it as a deep learning kind of device because there is no explicit model uh, that comes to the surface only with this twist that it learns from the future, not from the past. We can literally speak for it of a memory uh, of the future. And as I said, the pricing function is, in essence, an infinite concept because it wants until infinity to always get the parameters from the next uh, generation uh, derivative market uh, to infinity. And so we can wonder how can we represent it finitely? Uh, one way is to truncate it like Bergomi does and says, well, yes, for now it is just represented by my two factor model. And he adds the comment that ideally, if uh, the next generation uh, derivative market existed, then I will change this model. But we wonder, can we represent it entirely without truncating it? Maybe another way is to fold it into itself. And I will argue that such a thing can be achieved with the regime switching model. What is the trick here? The trick is that if we manage to make the iteration of calibration, what I can call the re of recalibration, or the, or the fact that at any stage that we are, we want typically this instance of the pricing function to get its parameter from the next generation, next generation um, uh, derivative model. If you, manage, if you manage to make that uh, feature, which is key here, the first component of our representation, maybe we could ultimately represent this infinity potentially in a potential way, not in actuality. And this I argue can be achieved with the thanks to the associativity of regime switching, will, uh, which I will explain now. So here is here is a regime switching uh, model, which for illustration I has represented as a three regime switching model. So I have three regimes, and each one uh, volatility, for instance, represented by the yellow uh, shape here, has different value in in each of the regime, and I switch stochastically between the regimes. So this is a discrete state. So the other shapes can be other parameters like credit or whatnot. But in any case, uh, you can think of it as a stochastic, as a discrete state stochastic volatility model. Therefore, on day one, you calibrate it to the surface of vanilla and you get some parameters. But in day two, there is a new surface of vanilla options. So you, if you recalibrate your model, you will get different parameters and therefore you get model B. 
And what will, in effect, be happening is a switching between these two regime switching models in such a way that if you took a step back and wondered what is the actual model, uh, the meta model that is running behind this, it will be switching between a three regime switching model. And thanks to the associativity of regime switching, this is still a regime uh, switching model A plus B only with six regimes. And chances are the next day that the options of next generation for typically the options on VIX, chances are that they themselves uh, start admitting of uh, market prices and start being traded independently of your model, therefore start exhibiting smiles of their own. And you would want also ideally the next day to calibrate to those uh, next generation options like the options on VIX. Uh, but then if you did that, the hope is that Perhaps because the sixth regime uh, may, may offer a, 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 a lot of parameters that, we, that may be useless, that we don't need them, maybe, maybe the hope is that the next day, even with a three regime switching model, I can manage to, to calibrate to the new surface of vanilla option together with the prices of options of next generation or the prices of VIX options. And of course, if I did so, it will be a regime switching with different parameters than the first two. That's why I call it a prime. In any case, this whole reasoning is meant to come to the following conclusion, which is ultimately, if you think of it, it is left unsettled whether the initial three regimes that I had here was a model of stochastic volatility or a more complex model or a model of stochastic volatility of volatility. And this feature is the key feature that we want uh, to to get degree of recalibration uh, from the start, because this is due to the discrete uh, nature of the regime switching and to the associativity. So with that, I get what I want, because this puts recalibration where it should be at the origin. And this is because according to my thinking and to my philosophy, recalibration, uh, which is the tacit rule, remember, of, of, the, of the new technology is the ground. It is the very matter of the market. And this is how, thanks to the regime switching, we managed to reduce the extensive infinity of the pricing function to make it become intensive. And now comes the crucial observation, which is, if you think of it for a minute, the regime switching is only the differentiation of DSM. I will explain in a minute, in a minute what I mean by differentiation. Because if you look at it, like the regime switching is, is literally a superposition uh, of DSM uh, uh, models. But what I mean by differentiation is in the sense of biological differentiation. The, dif the dictionary definition is that biological differentiation is the process during which young, immature, unspecialized cells take on individual characteristic and reach their mature specialized form and function. So this is the process whereby a primitive organism start growing specialized organs, if you will. So, the regime switching is the biological differentiation of DSM, provided we make the unsettlement between stochastic levels or the twist that we saw in the regime switching representation, provided we make that an integral part of BSM and of its meaning. So in such a way that ultimately you would think of BSM as the first egg, if you will, and the egg will get differentiated except that I want the differentiation to take place inside the egg, the same way that it took place inside my three regime, the differentiation between stock vol or stock vol of vol, and not outside the SM. So this is how I will ex ex escape the fact that we should discard the SM and resort to things that happen outside of it, such as stochastic volatility models. But how can I achieve that? How? Can I find that in, in Black Shores? And with, this is ultimately the operation which will get me to the language of the future is, as I said, by de detecting the same kind of twist in BSM itself. And to do that, I will use the following quotation uh, by Eliette Guémont, uh, which comes from an article that she wrote in 97. And this quotation is very quickly becoming my favorite quotation. And I've been using it systematically in all my recent talks. So Eliet in, is writing, is replying to somebody, actually it was Bouchot, I think, who was criticizing in 97, the Nobel Prize that BSM got. Uh, and the, the argument was that how could they get a Nobel Prize when their economy 
is riskless, it has no risk because volatility is constant, to which Eliot Guimont answers by saying, no, the economy of BSM is risky by definition because it amounts to exchanging volatility. And the fact that this risk should be materialized by a single little number sigma makes it palpable and immediate for everybody. So it's palpable, that's why it's ready to be exchanged. But I find that this, this quite amazing because Eliot is not saying that BSM is risky because volatility will eventually change and become stochastic. It says uh, BSM is risky by definition. So it's risky because volatility is constant. So it really sounds as if Eliot here is speak speaking a foreign language. This is the language that I need to get and need to understand. And there's a paradox here that we need to explain. So what's the paradox? It's true that constant volatility means options are valued redundantly with the underlying asset. So we are tempted to think, shall we change volatility then, make it stochastic and therefore banish or relegate BSM in order that options be non-redundant? Uh, Eliot says, no, we should keep BSM because BSM amounts to exchanging volatility, which is different from a changing volatility, different from making volatility stochastic. And what's happening here, in order to understand what's happening, we should really understand that option value is only now becoming option price because the option market is only now being, cre being cre created thanks to black holes. And when the option market is created, reality changes. So I completely change uh, reality and therefore change the thinking. And therefore, according to me, and this would be the solution of the paradox, the reason why options were never redundant is not that BSM was wrong. On the contrary, it's right, even it's perfectly right the reason is simply that options, according to Black, Black Scholes, as we will see, did not even exist so that we could call them redundant or whatnot. And this is why if we listen carefully to what BSM is saying, we will find it's a sublime formula because what is it? Let's listen to really the letter of BSM. So what BSM is literally saying is that stock S is the only thing trading on a stock, on a stock exchange. It, it admits of price and nobody is valuing the stock. It admits of price because it's left to the crowd of people who are bidding, uh, bidding for it uh, uh, and selling it. And this is like the crazy picture of the stock exchange, which scares a lot of people who think that therefore fundamental value no longer exists and there is only the random fluctuation of price, which is, which is true. But if you think for a minute, of course there is no fundamental valuation, but volatility becomes the new certainty. So volatility becomes the new fundamental concept of the market. It becomes the new fundamental value because this is the only thing that is fundamental now. And it so happens that BSM are going to derive from that fundamental value, which is volatility, the value of derivatives. And their derivation, as we know, is impeccable. But not only that, I claim that is it is unassailable also, the derivation. Why is it unassailable? because it is derived from the very criticism of value, which is price and the only existence of volatility of price. So it's itself derived from the criticism of value, which makes it as a valuation immunized to criticism. It is when we, when we all thought there is, that there was no valuation anymore and there was only price fluctuation of price and volatility, suddenly black shows are, are coming up with a superior kind of valuation, which is the valuation of options. So it is unassailable. But by the same token, it means that those derivatives, because they were valued out of the concept of the market, which is volatility, so they were, they were valued at the meta level, if you, if you will, there is no way those derivatives could be traded on the same trading floor as the underlying asset. So it's not, again, that they are redundant, they are not even written yet. So it, it poses the problem, what is it that will make them come to the trading floor? Of course, it will be an act of creation, and this is what will give us the new reality. I am further uh, comforted in this view by this following paper by Harrison and Pliska from 81, which as you know, is the paper that rigorized uh, Black Scholes. And if you read the paper, you re read literally, they say we have focused on a market where only the stock and bond are traded. And we have discovered that investors can manufacture call options for themselves, not for somebody else in this market at the price specified in the formula. They continue by saying, it is customary to go further arguing that arbitrage profits could be made if options were sold in a parallel market, meaning a different market th than this one. However, to reduce verbiage and to get a self-contained mathematical theory, because let's not forget that they want to rigorize black shows, we shall simply stop with the statement of attainability. So there is no option market. 
the option market is just verbiage in the formalism. So we wonder, how do we make it happen at last? Of course, we can only make it happen by forcing an interpretation uh, on the formalism, uh, as I will uh, show later. And to do so, I'm encouraged by an opening, which is presented by a recent paper uh, by Damiano Brigo, where he manages to construct two dynamics that exhibit the same historical volatility, but produce totally different option prices or implied volatilities. In this paper, probability-free models in option pricing statistically indistinguishable dynamics and historical versus implied uh, volatility. So in this paper, if you think about it, because historical volatility, according to the analysis, is unable to discriminate between option prices, therefore it's useless as a concept in an environment where the only problem that we have is option pricing. So we should really disqualify uh, uh, statistics and uh, uh, disqualify historical volatility and only think implied volatility. So to me, historical volatility and implied volatility, it's not only that they are different numerically as, as uh, Damiano Brigo has shown us, but there are two alternative, and, and by that I mean incompatible interpretations of the formalism. Therefore, two alternative interpretations of time. They don't even coexist in the same time. So according to me, you either have statistical prediction or you have the derivatives market. You cannot mix the two unless in the looseness of language and thought, which needs to be fixing then. So how to make the sublime volatility that I alluded to in the formalism, how to make it solid is the following. Is by saying that the volatility that we had recognized as being the fundamental value, remember the fundamental concept of the market was equality because it's a concept, conceptual volatility as such and quantified. One way of quantified it, quantifying it would be through the assets volatility or through statistics. This is the path chosen by econometricians and econophysicists. But another way, incompatible with the first one, another way of first putting a number on the conceptual and unquantified or sublime volatility is through the option price or implied volatility directly. So from conceptual volatility, the first time I put a number on it is implied volatility. I don't even bother to think about historical volatility. And by the way, this kind of interpretation is more satisfactory than the other one. Why? Because random price combined with dynamic size of the holding is a more complete representation of trading uh, than just statistics. And the important note here is to note that Implied volatility, uh, even in the paper uh, by Brigo, cannot be had without perfect dynamic replication because he bases an, his analysis on a pathwise uh, analysis in, in the paper. So perfect dynamic replication is key here. So in this new understanding, BSM is the first individual of a genetical iteration not the first contingent stage of a historical sequence. And as such, Black-Scholes should never be relegated. So in summary, I have shown that the pricing function of the market models afforded us the technology of the future by turning the logic from backward to forward. And now with the return to BSM through the re of recalibration and through the compress compressing the argument of the regime switching into Eliot Gaiman, I offer something even stronger. I offer a new language the key, the intensity, the word of the future. The technology of the future thus becomes the language of the future in which statistics and their backward logic are forbidden by the very rules of grammar. And why do we need to fix the language? Because if you look for a moment at the classical language of finance as expressed by Derman, for instance, and we all agree with Derman, he says a difficulty common to every financial model is that one can get statistics only from looking back. We cannot know the future expected returns standard deviations and correlations of the stock. So the only way, according to him, to get the future back in the picture, because we have no traction on the future, is through complex propositions such as the following one. I keep uh, citing him. He says, if you know the future volatility of the stock, and if that volatility prevails, you will be able to replicate the option. And my comment is that if you know, if that future volatility prevails, you will be able introduce alien time registers and therefore logics that are incomprehensible conditions or utterances from the point of view of the timeless formalism because the formalism just says let volatility be sigma so what what does knowledge and and if you know future volatility what does it have to do here so we need to fix the language and therefore we have always had on our hands a stank scandal not of finance but of the philosophy of finance 
because as we have seen, financial models are at a loss to grasp or express the future when the future is supposed to be everything. And so I wonder when will the time come when the future becomes the common natural language of all financial models and not the common difficulty and the past and the whole notion of historical data become themselves unutterable and unthinkable. So I, I need a language such a way that I don't even think about the statistics. So my assumption is that language is really what informed thought. So if I get the language right, I get the thinking right. And philosophy is here to set the language straight. So we used to think uh, with Derman that we could not know the future statistics. What I now propose is something much stronger. I suppose I propose that we shouldn't even project the statistics in thought. They simply don't exist in the future. When the market exists and the proper time of the market is established, even thinking of a future historical volatility uh, becomes forbidden. Thinking the past into the future or translating in the sense of sliding historical volatility forward in time is not thinking the future. The future must exert a constraint on thought and it must resist against the sliding forward of statistics. It must raise the wall of the option market to block such sliding of the statistics. Even in Brigo, we should do that because Brigo himself compares uh, historical volatility and implied volatility. Whereas I say the solution is even simpler. Historical volatility simply doesn't exist when the market exists. The future is a different category altogether than the past. The proper thought and proper language and proper translation of the future is the options market. And the assumption here again is that what is thinkable for us depends on the language we know even better. The language we speak can actually change the way that we think, including the way we think about time. And these last two sentences that I have just uttered here are actually quotations from a paper I have found on the internet, which analyzes the philosophy of language in the science fiction movie Arrival, where, as you know, you have alien creatures here, the heptapod, which uh, speak a language that has circular patterns. And this is a language where they can speak the future and where they can tell the future. Earlier, I used the expression, the memory of the future. And here I was happy to learn by reading this paper that for the heptapods of arrival, the future can literally be remembered just as easily as the past. So it's a language like that, that I'm looking for. And finally, now uh, the promised words about BSM and GPT. So BSM or the whole universe of trading is the language of the future, according to me, whereas GPT is, as you know, a statistical algorithm. So according to me, it will fare bad in the future. It's the language of the past. BSM has one adjustable parameter, volatility, except that we made this parameter infinitely self-differentiate in, within itself, within its egg through, you know, the regime switching and all of that. So potentially I have the infinity of, of the, all the categories of options, whereas GPT has a trillion adjustable uh, parameters. And there is a further danger, which is that because with the ultimate statistics of GPT and with language being the ultimate frontier, it's no longer clearly defined what is future and what is past. So we all wonder, will the future emerge from GPT? And this is a danger because language that GPT has finally conquered is the limit. There doesn't seem always to be a clearly defined next generation derivative market, which will put this language to the test of the future and which will make the future non-redundant uh, with the past. So there's a danger here because it's statistical. However, it's the ultimate statistics. Thank you. What modifications you suggest to make the difference in stochastic process as an integral part of BSM? So of course, I mean, I, I cannot make it an integral part of BSM. Uh, my favorite model has always been the regime switching model, which um, uh, is, is to me a stochastic process that we should use to really get uh, the recalibration uh, going all the time and not stop at any level. Uh, however, here, just for the purpose of, of, the, of, the, of my talk, I wanted to argue that in the end, it's of the same nature as Black and Scholes. And this is why Black and Scholes uh, should not be discarded because it was the first organism in such a way. And if we really interpret Black Scholes according to what Eliette Dima is saying, uh, really you get an idea that stochastic volatility uh, models that just solve the smile by matching all the prices of derivatives are not really the solution of the smile because we want volatility always to be exchanged. Are there concrete 
factor from research that BSM will fade, what factors are they can be subject to those research papers? Uh, so uh, Black Scholes ca cannot fade because, I mean, everybody will still be using the language of Black Scholes. Remember, in my talk, I insisted on the language, and the language of Black Scholes is implied volatility. We will never be rid of implied volatility. So even though if you argue against the Vega hedging by saying everything will be ultimately be done by deep hedging and we have no longer usage of the framework of the Greeks, remember what Buehler was saying, I say, no, that wouldn't work because a market maker of options needs to have a handle on the Vegas because it's only if he has a handle on the Vega that he is able to quote ultimately a bit and ask spread for the options he's making. So, and if you remember like early papers in the 2000s written by Taleb and by Hogg uh, at the period where they used to argue for BSM, they used to argue that any, even a trader which is armed, who is armed by a stochastic volatility uh, model will never actually beat a trader who knows the ins and outs of Black Scholes because again of the language of replied volatility that is not um, uh, ready to go yet.